the following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so happy to have you here with us because we are going to talk a lot about the signing day slash transfer portal, kind of touching on both of those, both of them very much going with each other. And it's kind of crazy this year when you see just how big both of these days are because you have you have the transfer portal, which I think is bigger this year than ever. We've talked about that, but we're going to talk more. And then, of course, recruiting. We're going to get into the recruiting rankings and where everybody falls after signing day. We're recording this during some of the madness that might be still going on, so some things might change. So bear with us as as some of it might have changed uh, by the time we get there. But uh, overall, most of it's been done throughout the day, uh, and it's looking very, very interesting when we look at all of this. We're going to talk about some of our winners and losers from the rankings and everything. And we're gonna also going to get into college basketball and a little bit more elsewhere. But before I get too much further, let me first bring in my co-hosts. First, we got the man from Alabama himself, Blake Lane. Uh, Blake, how you doing, man? What's up, fellas? Uh, just been busy today with National Signing Day. The Auburn Tigers uh, on one site are the number seventh ranked class in the country. Uh, a lot of movement, man. Hugh Freeze doing his thing. And then I think on another one, they're like eighth. And another one, they're like ninth. So uh, I, I think their composite ranking altogether was like the, at number eighth in the country or whatever. So uh, just really impressed with what Hugh has done. And uh, yeah, I think it was a great day for college football. And um, I'm, I'm excited to talk some other things and and uh, and be here with you boys. Yeah, absolutely. And Jeremy, how are we doing over there? I'm doing pretty good. It's been a crazy day just for – I mean, it's been crazy since the transfer pool and everything has been going. But it's just so hard to wrap my head around just everything just because it feels like every 30 seconds my phone's buzzing for ESPN, just – blockbuster moves trades with the transfer portal and everything but going pretty good and obviously we got some other stuff to talk about like we're going to bring back the two-minute drill obviously we're going to be talking a little bit about the guy named aaron Rodgers, who we expected to see a lot more as to just out of one series of football then also bringing back the name some guy named john morant that we finally get to talk about again but thankfully in a positive note then obviously we got some other stuff that we're going to talk about so i'm going to cut the chit chat guys and let's get rolling with it yeah, absolutely, guys. I mean, starting off here, I mean, we're going to get into the recruiting and everything that's gone down. Blake, like you said, your Auburn Tigers, very happy with what he was doing over there, man. He's He brought in some big-time guys and then making making some flips. But let's start off at number one, the obvious, and that's the Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, I, I don't really have too much to say about that because I just – you expect it at this point. Kirby's just going to recruit, and that's where Kirby lives. He doesn't really need that transfer portal as much. Uh, what's, what's worked for him for – so long is, is going to keep on working for him. And, and I mean, number one, anybody surprised by that? I'm not at all. Um, I actually had a buddy reach out to me and he's like, what's going down in Athens, Georgia? And he's like, they're having players leave the portal left and right. And I'm like, well, first off, they got 85 blue chips over there. So playing time is at a bare minimum for most. And then they're also signing the number one recruiting class in the country. So, you know, I, I can – I understand why guys are leaving the portal, uh, getting into the portal and everything and leaving. So it's what Kirby does, man. He beat us out for K.J. Bolden, the number one safety in the country today. And, uh, you know, it happens. It's part of it. Uh, You know, the kid's from Georgia, and he was committed to Florida State, and Auburn made a push, and and I guess Georgia came a-calling, and kid wanted to play in his home state. Can't blame him, not mad about it, and, you know, Georgia, they they did what they had to do, man. That's why they're, you know, they're on top of the college football world the past two years, and, and they were in the SEC championship game again this year. So, you're right, man. That's how Kirby gets it done. He doesn't attack the portal a whole lot, not not too not too much, but uh, he he really grinds on high school kids and and getting it done in in the recruiting ranks. So, uh, that's how he's built that program. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested to see how it all shapes up too after we get a few more years into the portal the way that it is nowadays um, because, you know, it, it's hard not to group these two together between recruiting and in the portal because you are still trying to recruit. And then on top of that, it's kind of unfair to college football coaches that they have to not only recruit the guys that they want to bring in, but they also have to recruit the guys to keep them there in their program. So kind of going there, I mean, that's, that's one thing. Uh, you know, just looking at it, whether you're going to build on the the portal itself or build from recruiting. And I think 
personally, I feel like there's got to be a perfect mixture of the two, uh, and you're, you're going to see over over time where that really plays into the, the equation. Um, but then, of course, you know, you look at, at, at some teams, like I think Ole Miss, I, that might be one of the exceptions because you saw what they were able to do this year with a better year and uh, sitting at 10 wins, looking pretty decent. But then you look over at Colorado uh, and where they rank, I mean, in, in recruiting-wise, they were like past 90, somewhere like 95th, 96, something like that in the nation in recruiting. And, of course, they're going to attack the portal for everything, and that's that's one way to go. But we, we saw what that was able to do for Florida this past season with only four wins. We'll see where it's able to kind of go going forward. Um, but number two, another no no big surprise. We got Alabama sitting there at number two. Uh, they were able to pull in some big guys. I know they had that big corner, uh, Jalen Mabwaki, uh, who was one that they were able to pull in, uh, and then even a, a quarterback who apparently is actually practicing with the team, just you know in preparation, not able to play until next spring. Um, but they got Julian Sayan, uh, and that's that's a big time pull in for them, and, and I'm sure that's going to be something that. We'll kind of heat up the quarterback room a little next season uh, and seeing where Jalen Jay Milrow sits, uh, I guess, kind of open it up to you guys. Any any surprises with Alabama at number two? Uh, no no surprise, Josh. Uh, completely expected. Uh-oh, my little boy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was completely expected, man. Uh, and, and they got a big running back flip today from Miami. Yeah. And it's just Nick Saban just doing what he does, man. And that's why he continues to also stay on top of the college football world. Yeah, I mean it's it's crazy, but I mean Jeremy, looking at looking at what Alabama's doing, uh, you know, there's there's been buzz for I don't know how many years now whether Nick Saban's going to go out, uh, but I mean whether whether he retires this year or or and what is it like eight years from now whenever his contract is up, uh, I mean I, I don't I think the way that Nick Saban builds up these recruiting classes like this, regardless of when he goes out, it's definitely going to leave the next guy in, in a good good position. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, for whenever that time comes for when Nick Saban finally hangs it up, it's definitely going to obviously be different because we're obviously all just used to Nick Saban's mentality, just going out and finding top five star recruits and tier people. But I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, just getting some of these guys that they've able to acquire. I mean, realistically, I don't see Alabama taking any steps back. I think they're just going to keep shooting for the stars here and just keep just keep simply rolling in this kind of aspect. And I think we're honestly going to maybe see a better Alabama team going into next year than what we currently have for this season. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, looking at what they had this season, that's what's kind of the shocking thing with Alabama is this might be like one of the worst overall rosters and overall talent that they've had in a while. And that's that's saying, I mean, I guess it's not really saying a whole lot because it's still a great squad that they've got and they've made it to the college football mm-hmm. playoffs again. And they're, they're a team that you, you would expect to win it all. I think a lot of people are putting their money on Alabama to come out of this thing. Um, but kind of going down, uh, one that kind of sh- shocks me is what Dan Lanning is doing at number three, Oregon Ducks. Uh, they they pull, in, pull in the number three ranked recruiting class on top of what they're doing in the transfer portal, and we'll get to some of the things that they're doing in the transfer portal uh, in a minute, but just looking at them and seeing what they've been able to do in recruiting, I, I'm, I'm personally surprised that they're able to do this. I mean, kind of talking about a couple of things. Of course, we've talked about Dylan Gabriel coming in from the transfer portal, uh, and then, of course, now they bring in Dante Moore, another quarterback, to add to that roster into the transfer portal. Now, I mean, when, when you attack the transfer portal the way that they have, it's hard to recruit as well as they have. And I, personally, I'm I'm looking at the way that Dan Lanning's doing this and keeping it 50-50. He might he might be onto something. Uh, Josh, I, I'll be honest with you, man. Dan, the way he's doing it geographically too, he's not just doing it out on the west coast. He's doing it in the south. Uh, out on the East Coast, everything, man. He's going nationwide with this thing, and he's trying to build an SEC program up there, and he's trying to get dirty in the trenches. And, look, he lost Bo Nix and Ty Thompson. I guess he didn't have the faith in him. So, uh, you know, they bring in Dylan Gabriel for a year, and then you got Dante Moore, who should have went to Oregon in the first place uh, instead of UCLA. And and now you're going to have – Dante Moore sitting behind Dylan Gabriel to learn for a year. And, you know, Dan's going to attack DBs in the portal. I know he brought in the the, uh, the great recruiting class. Oregon's going to be just fine, man. And, and if he keeps winning at Oregon and Nick Saban coaches a couple more years, 
look out for Dan Lanning to Alabama. That is a serious, serious thing, man. I I know Oregon fans hate to hear that, but Dan, uh, I just with him working at Alabama as a GA before, and then him being on Kirby staff, there's just so so much uh, familiarity with the program and the conference and it's just it it seems like a fit man it seems like a fit that would really be there for alabama yeah yeah absolutely i mean looking looking at what he's doing too and we we saw that just from the physicality from oregon this past year and really the last two years with dan lanning at the helm uh, seeing what he's able to do and i think they progressively got better this year now just seeing where what he's building on top of it but jumping to number four another a team that we w- would expect to be up there maybe the top five top ten out obviously would be the the ohio state buckeyes uh they bring in a couple of big time guys number one being a wide receiver uh and jeremiah smith who was a big time wide receiver coming out of this class that's one thing you just expect from ohio state adding receivers to it uh, and then they also get on, on the def- defensive side of the ball one of their big time guys uh was bryce west so uh, adding to that defense which we knew ever since they got jim Knowles in as the defense coordinator they're going to keep on getting these guys in uh and and you know it's it's surprising seeing where the Buckeyes are sitting too because it's they've they've lost so much between the transfer portal and the draft this year and still kind of a question mark to my knowledge on Marvin Harrison Jr. as well so you know just looking at how much they've lost as a as a squad altogether uh that's going to be a little interesting to see and then of course if we remember Dylan Riola who just announced and he he committed to Nebraska now Dylan Riola was at Ohio State and that's where he was committed he changed his his commit uh, over to uh, Georgia and kind of a weird story there with him too because he even moved to Georgia to play high school ball said that's where his home is now and then he decommits and goes over to Nebraska and so I, I mean I know we haven't really talked a whole lot about that uh, you know that move but uh, you know just looking at from the Ohio State perspective now you don't have this five-star QB who's supposed to be this next generational talent coming in. That's kind of the big one for me that I'm a little a little bit questionable on with Ohio State is where they're going to lean when it comes to a quarterback because I feel like a lot of the quarterbacks have left the transfer portal. Uh, and, you know, wh- where, are, where are you going to go for that position? I think that's the big one for me. Well, I know they got the bowl game and everything. Um, and what was the kid's name that was the backup? Um, um, I'm trying to think of what um, his was. Is it Devin Brown? Yeah, Devin or, Brown. There you go. You got yeah. it. Um, so I, I think they're going to give him an opportunity to show what he's got in the bowl game, and then you're going to have the second portal window open up. There will be more portal quarterbacks hit that window. My thing with Ohio State, man, is Ryan Day. I feel like there was a lot of pressure on Ryan Day in this signing period, and there was – there was some talk about them starting to maybe lose a couple of those top commitments, especially I think it was the Houston kid that was getting a lot of buzz to Alabama. And uh, they, they continued to push on him, push on him and they got him to sign with, with Ohio state. So that's my biggest takeaway from, from what Ryan day did today was I feel like there was a lot of pressure. The losing streak to Michigan is still intact. But he come away with the top five class and secured his job for another year at Ohio State, in my opinion. Isn't it crazy to think about too is that we're we're talking about like where Ryan Day as a, as an eleven win coach every year is on the hot seat, and it, it's just it's just because of what the fans are, are really expecting out of him. Maybe maybe a little bit of an over expectations on him, but uh, and it's 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 a lot of that comes from that rivalry loss too. I'll be honest. This it's you can take this as a shot at the Big Ten or whatever. Um, Ohio State and Michigan play one game a year. Uh oh, tell them, buddy. Tell them. <laughs> SEC. Well, SEC's, SEC's the best conference in the world. Um, <laughs> they play one tough game a year, man, and uh, that's just that's just it, you know. Well, and uh, the divisions finally go away next year, so you're going to see that. And then, of course, adding some of the teams like Washington and Oregon, even USC in the mix, teams like that coming over to the Big Ten. I think that helps them a lot in their their overall uh, their overall win win. You know, their 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 strength of strength wins, I guess. Of, yeah, strength of schedule too, man. Like nobody cares to see Ohio State beat Illinois. Uh, 
42 to 17 or whatever. Like, uh, I, you just don't get that down here in the Southeastern Conference. So, um, I, I don't know what it would be like to wake up on an a, a 11 a.m. on a Saturday and watch Northwestern and Indiana play. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I, 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 I look at the Big Ten. I think there's some good that comes from. I think adding these teams, it's going to make it a little better. But what the SEC was able to do in adding Oklahoma and Texas, that was so much better than anything from the Pac-12 the Big Ten could have added. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I stand there. But we'll kind of roll through the next few of these. Uh, we got Texas at number five. Steve Sarkeesian really showing what he can do in the, in the recruiting. Really happy uh, with what he's able to do there. And, as, of course, coming into the SEC, you want those big recruiting classes. You want those SEC-type recruiting classes. So this might – might I mean, from what, I, what I've seen from Texas in this recruiting class, might be one of the best I've seen in a long time. So that's really good for Sarkeesian. I know they got, like, the number one running back in the nation, uh, Jarek Gibson, I think. And so that was really big for them, uh, pulling him in. That was one guy that stood out. And then number six, Florida State. Uh, they, they moved up here recently in the last few hours, uh, and you know, I guess several hours here now. But uh, they, they were a little higher, dropped down low, and then bounced their way a little bit up higher again. Uh, so number six, Florida State, they've – They've had a hard time. They've had a couple, like you you mentioned a little bit ago, uh, that you know they've they've had a few decommits or flips. That's why we kind of call this flipmas uh, for those who are are big time uh, college football fans. So seeing where they've stood, I think this is really big for the Seminoles. Uh, and looking at Norvell and seeing what he has right now, I think this is a very important recruiting class for him, being able to get these guys up and ready for for the next step in the big league and especially with them in talks with all these rumors about them leaving the ACC very soon who knows what what's actually going to happen with that but getting them ready for the next step and getting them ready for uh, what comes next and then the one that I'm really excited about obviously number seven Oklahoma a top 10 recruiting class something that Lincoln Riley could never do at Oklahoma uh, is is getting to the top 10 of a recruiting class. You see this from Brent, Brent Venables. Not only that, but we've mentioned, I think I've mentioned it on the show before, something that Brent Venable does, Venables, what he does is when he gets a verbal commit, he tells the kids, you don't verbal commit unless you're ready to sign with us and you're done taking other visits. And that kind of assures that most of your verbal commits are very true and that they're actually going to commit. Today, Oklahoma had 27 out of 27 of their verbal commits commit to Oklahoma. That was huge. That was something that really Whoa. shocked me seeing all 27. So that's something very excited to see this. Uh, we get a big time running back, uh, Taylor Tatum. That I'm, I'm excited to see him kind of get worked into the mix. And then of course we just got one from the transfer portal too that I'm, I'm forgetting on his name. So seeing Oklahoma in the top 10, that's very exciting to see where they, they stand. And then of course, Blake right below Oklahoma, uh, you guys jumped up a lot throughout the day on those rankings for just about every site. Auburn Tigers coming in at number eight. Uh, and then we've got Miami down at number nine. I think that's really big for Mario Cristobal and seeing what he's putting together in Miami because we've seen Miami not perform quite as well as we expected them to in the first two years under Mario Cristobal. This is something that saves him a little bit of a saving grace. And number two in the ACC, you can't really be too upset with that. Uh, so seeing him kind of get in there. Uh, and then at number 10, the Penn State Nittany Lions. Uh, so that, that's really all that we've got for the top 10. I guess when you look overall all throughout the country, I mean, do you guys have any winners, losers for the, the recruiting so far, especially today being the early signing day? Uh, yeah, man, the Auburn Tigers, number one team in the country, baby. We're back. Um, no, for real. I love it. I, I, love the uh, my, th my thing with – with Auburn is, you know, it, we just went through a disaster for a couple of years. And uh, and to see, like, I was so excited when I woke up this morning on early signing day. I was just like, man, we're back. We're about to sign a top 10 class. Like, we're about to make it happen. And Hugh Freeze is just doing the dang thing. And uh, we're getting elite level talent. Like, I know we're not going to sign everybody that we're talking about, but we're going to get most of them. And, there's just a lot of excitement, man, and uh, it's it's fun to talk about. So I, I'm proud of the Tigers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I, t I told you that a little bit ago. I'm the same way with Oklahoma, seeing where they were able to, to land. Top 10, I mean, that's that's it's been a while. Um, but for me, one, one that kind of is a little alarming was the Florida Gators. They started off with all of the verbal commits that they had. This was really big for Billy Napier. Uh, and 
to be able to be in the top 10, I mean, they, they were up at number six when I checked earlier in the day and some of these rankings and they drop all the way where currently they're sitting at number 13. So they've dropped a lot in the rankings for recruiting. Uh, that's that's a loss in my book. You lost a lot of big time guys and you lost them to in-state rivals too because you lost them to Miami and you lost them to Florida State. So that's one thing that losing them to those those schools that makes it that makes it hurt even worse. Uh, and then one that kind of shocked me a little bit too was that LSU dropped down to number 14. They were a little higher earlier on in the day, but they're another one of those teams where I think Chip Kelly's really good about finding guys in the transfer portal, bringing them in. So maybe this is him just trying to mix it around. Uh, and then another one was Michigan uh, down at number 16. So that was that was some some schools that kind of popped up to me as just how low they were. But then again, I think this is also just certain teams like Auburn and Oklahoma and even Penn State really jumping up in the rankings, not so much that they're falling down in the rankings. Uh, other than Florida, I think Florida was one that they just had so many high hopes and I'm not sure what it was, but something something wasn't right there at Florida for them, and they jumped ship. So that was one that was really uh, sad to see for Florida, and I think this was th- that could have been a really big step for them. Um, but uh, kind of jumping over now and, and seeing over, I guess, did you guys have anything anything else to say in there for the uh, recruiting? No, nah? all right, no, I think oh. we're all good. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump over to the transfer portal then and seeing everything in the transfer portal. We've been talking a lot about the transfer portal and everything that's been happening over there. There's been some big-time moves, uh, and right now you're starting to see a lot of guys hurry up and start to commit into the transfer portal just because you are realizing that some of these signing the signing day uh, guys, I mean, that's that's something that's going to be really big. you, you got a lot of scholarships being taken from signing day alone. So you got to jump in and find a team. So you're seeing a lot of guys start to, to, to commit. You've got out of the 1,652 guys in the portal, you've got 496% of them, or sorry, not percent, 496 of them have committed. Uh, a few of the big time names that we've seen uh, here, I'm sorry, I, it kind of jumbled around my order that I had here. Uh, so first, you know, kind of looking through, uh, we, we talked about Cam Ward. Uh, he has still uh, kind of been not com- completely committed. That was one that I was a little shocked to see. But with Miami, after signing day, I think that's one that kind of leans even further over towards Miami for him. Uh, so that was one that I saw. And then, of course, we bring up, we brought up uh, Dante Moore. I kind of wanted to get your guys' thoughts on Dante Moore going to Oregon because this was a little shock to me because Dante is the type of guy that he is absolutely a starter at, at any program that he goes to. Do you think this creates – a big competition there in Oregon, or do you think Dylan Gabriel's their guy for this year since he's pretty much a one and done, and then Dante Moore has some time to develop underneath him? Uh, I mean, Blake, I'll kind of start off with you. Where do you feel with Dante Moore going to Oregon? Uh, just like I said a while ago, man, I think this is a big move for the Ducks because you give that chance for Dante to sit behind Dylan, a guy that's a veteran in college football, and he's played many a big-time football game. So I think <sighs> – I think if Dante would have went to Oregon like he was supposed to the first go around, he would have gotten to sit behind Bo Nix and he would have been moved into that starting role more than likely over Ty Thompson. But uh, he went to UCLA. It didn't work out there. Chip Kelly, whatever. Um, I think they roll with Dylan and I think Dylan uh, is a teacher uh, and an advisor to Dante Moore. And then next year to be Dante's uh, program. So, yeah, and I, I think it's kind of funny, too, because you saw this last year with Dylan Gabriel kind of being that mentor over to Jackson Arnold and, and handing that off to him. Now he's going to another situation where it, the exact same thing is going to happen, kind of handing that torch over. But, uh, I mean, Jeremy, where do you kind of feel? Do you feel like this is going to be more of a competition, or do you think it's more kind of like what Blake said, more of a mentorship? I am really agree with what Blaze says. It's going to be a mentorship. I mean, you get you get somebody with a high caliber like Dante War. I mean, he's definitely going to be balling out, to say the least. Like, obviously, getting, getting your feet rolling with a new quarterback, obviously, compared to being from UCLA. I mean, obviously, even with Dylan Gabriel's situation coming from Oklahoma now going up to duck country. I mean, I realistically think once the time starts to get going in the season or even like even maybe before the season, obviously when they're even finally getting to practice, I think they're going to have a a really good connection to each other. And I sincerely think that this could be a really good situation for um, Oregon. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm not saying that 
now obviously the Oregon doesn't have Bo Nix or as Blake would say, Bo Heisman in his mind. Um, I know realistically a lot of people think after this it was going to be a complete turnover for Oregon, but I realistically think that Oregon is still definitely going to – they're still, they're still going to be a good team, don't get me wrong, but adding this kind of power to Oregon's roster, I think it's definitely going to be a good one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, looking over – at an offensive lineman, he leaves Oklahoma, which hurts Oklahoma because uh, I think I mentioned this to you guys. We lost all five offensive linemen to either mm. draft or transfer portal. Uh, so, I mean, just seeing seeing that, uh, that, that really hurts. We've seen some uptick in it with the recruiting and uh, kind of outside of the, the box there. And I think even from the transfer portal a little bit as well. Plus, we just have one of the best offensive line coaches statistically in the country. So can't be too too worried, but it does bring up some concerns. But Caden Green was a freshman. He was an amazing uh, offensive lineman. He was a, a tackle, and he played amazing for Oklahoma. He commits over to Missouri. <coughs> Kind of seeing that, I mean, Blake, we, we've talked a lot about this, but Missouri now picking up some guys in the transfer portal that could really help out, especially an offensive lineman, kind of helping out and building that program. Uh, I mean, do you, do you see guys like him with being Caden Green being the biggest offensive lineman in the transfer portal? Do you think this is kind of a sign of what's to come for Mizzou? Yeah, and, uh, you know, they were just wanting to fire Coach Drink uh, last year. Yeah. And – I think that's a problem that we have in college football right now is we want instant success, and when somebody doesn't give you first, second-year success, you want to fire them. And he's clearly showed you that he can attack the portal now. He can win games. He can recruit at the high school level. I mean, they were in multiple battles today, uh, won some, lost some. The guy can coach football. So – I think as we move forward in whatever team that you pull for, I think you you kind of kind of pull back a little bit and say, hey, look, this isn't a one to two year thing. This is a three to four year type thing, man. And you know, I think that's what Drink did, and I think it's paying off for Missouri. Yeah, absolutely. And the last one I'll, I'll touch on for the transfer portal for today, just because I feel like we've we've touched a lot on all these teams so far. But Kyle McCord originally thinking that he would go to Nebraska. And it leaned very heavy in that direction. All of a sudden, things start to take a turn. It sounds like Dylan Riola might come in. The rumor was that Matt Rule and the coaching staff said, if you come in, Dylan Riola seems like he might be committed. We're going hard after him. It's going to be a competition. Uh, plus, Nebraska's got another really good quarterback that's coming in, too, who's going to be a freshman. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name. But you know, bringing in a couple of big-time quarterbacks, now Kyle McCord switches and, and jumps ship. He goes and signs with Syracuse. So we're talking Ohio State quarterback who was good enough to lead them to 11 wins, play very well, and, and get them just outside of really the playoffs when it, when it really comes down to it because you were one game away. So now you see Kyle McCord go over to Syracuse. Is this maybe just a, a sign of Syracuse and, and just w what we're looking for in the future there, or is this just – does this speak more to Kyle McCord? What do you think, Blake? I think it speaks more to Kyle McCord and him just not being that guy. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm never gonna like down a kid or like bash a kid or anything like that. But I just don't think he was the guy at Ohio State, and I think he saw the Syracuse job open up. Said, "Hey, there's probably not a competition there. I can go there." And I can play right away. And that, that's what happened, man. And uh, I don't think it's going to change Syracuse's outcome to their season. They're going to be five and seven, six and six, whatever. Uh, that's a basketball school, always will be. And, you know, good luck to Kyle McCord, though. I, I just I didn't understand why he up and entered the transfer portal at Ohio State unless he was asked to. I, I don't know. It's still kind of. That's kind of where I'm leaning. I feel like they had a discussion behind closed doors about, hey, this is where we're sitting for next year. Because I'll be honest with you, personally, I've said this, I think, on the show even. I don't think Kyle McCord's a bad quarterback whatsoever. I do think he's a good quarterback. But when you see the weapons that he had and, and, and the talent around him overall there at Ohio State and still only putting up the numbers that he did, it wasn't 
these crazy, just ungodly numbers with the with the crazy, ungodly talent at wide receiver, and even uh, guys like like Trey and uh, Trey and, um, and, and uh, uh, Henderson in the backfield with them. You know, just looking at everything they had. I feel like his stats would have been better if he was a great quarterback. Uh, and, and, you know, it comes down to clutch time. We saw him come down and, and be really clutch against the, against Notre Dame in that last drive. But outside of that, you didn't really see it. And against Michigan, I know I don't blame it all on him because I do think there was some pressure that got there a little too early. So you can put a little bit of the blame on the offensive line. But when it came down to crunch time against Michigan in the biggest game of the year, you couldn't complete the drive. And, and again, with that kind of a talent around you, uh, Jeremy, where, how do you feel about about Kyle McCord going up to Syracuse? Was that a little bit of a shock to you too? Yeah, that was definitely a big shocker to me just because, I mean, like you guys have said, don't get me wrong, Kyle McCord, he's not – He's not the best quarterback in the in the college football era, but he's not the worst. He's a good quarterback here in this in this era. But I mean, I there was to me there was definitely something that had to be said behind closed doors, and I do agree with you like that, Josh. Just because I wasn't expecting Kyle McCord just to you wouldn't see him just to up and leave and say deuces, I'm out. But I mean, at the end of the day, like. There's there's been people saying, oh, it's just because Marvin Harrison Jr. ain't there anymore. I'm like, no, it ain't. It's not just because of another individual player outside of yourself. I like I said, I I don't necessarily agree with Kyle McCord's decision, but at the end of the day, I'm just gonna keep watching college football and I hope nothing but the best for you, buddy. And let's see how you do at Syracuse. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think this this could be a little bit of a momentum boost for Syracuse. I don't think he's going to lead them to too much more, but you know, you, you can talk about a little bit of a ripple ripple effect if you're able to bring bigger talent in, more talent wants to come with. And you're starting to see a little bit of that, but nothing so monumental that it's really going to change the outcome of their season. Um, because you know, it, just seeing everything there at Syracuse, they've had a couple of decent seasons, but nothing really too big to speak about. They're not sitting there fighting for an ACC championship, uh, which wouldn't even be that much when you when you really look at what the ACC is right now. But let's go ahead and jump on. But before we do, we first have to mention our sponsors, a new sponsor of ours here on the show and one that we're very happy to have, and that is Factor Meals. You got, During this busy season, this holiday season and everything that you guys have going on, you might be looking for a nutritious, fav- flavorful meal that will fuel you on your jam-packed days. That's where Factor comes into play because Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service and can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time and stay on track with your, heavy, with your healthy lifestyle while tracking all of your holiday to-dos. Guys, Factor Meals is a very amazing product. Uh, it's very, very uh, nutritious. It's it's something that's very fun, and I know uh, Blake's even shown you some of the stuff that they sent him here. What what do you got there, Blake? I have the tropical fruit smoothie. Uh, I as you see, I can show you that I did like it. I, I swallowed it down uh, yesterday when I got home, and uh, it's pretty good, man. Like, it is not bad at all. I enjoyed it. I have not tried any of the meals yet, but the smoothie was fantastic. And I think there was a strawberry banana one also that my wife tried, and she said that uh, she will definitely be going back for that. So, uh, I, hopefully I can get to try that one. So yeah. I, I enjoy it, man. I even use them uh, as a spit cup now too. So. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. But no, I mean, they really are. They're amazing. I've used Factor in the past, so I knew what they were all about. Whenever they wanted to sign with us and, and be a sponsor, I was extremely happy, extremely excited to have them on. You guys can try Factor as well. Um, because honestly, you don't want to miss out because cross cross meal, uh, you, you can you can simply cross meal prepping off of your list. That's one thing that's really hard for me. I'm on the road a lot, and things like trying to pack my meals is one thing that's just a lot for me to take on. You know, and and a lot of the times I have to eat out. That's not very healthy, uh, and it's it gets old after a while too. 
but I can cross that off my, my list. And especially with it being holiday season and you're busy just around the holidays in, in general, uh, it's just one less thing to work, about, you know, to work around and have to work into your schedule. So skip the meal planning, the grocery shopping, the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up, and get fa Factors fresh, never frozen meals delivered to your door. They're ready in just two minutes. That's the amazing part. You just pop it in the microwave and pop it in there for two minutes. They're ready to go. Uh, so all you have to do is heat it up and enjoy. So head to factormeals.com slash rising250 and use code rising250 for 50% off. Guys, that's an amazing deal and one that you do not want to miss out on. So again, that's code R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O-5-0 at factormeals.com slash rising250. Get yourself 50% off and save so much time this holiday season with Factor Meals. I promise, and as Jeremy would say, you will not be disappointed. But guys, let's get back to the action. Uh, again, thank you to Factor Meals for sponsoring this episode and uh, being a partner of the show. But let's get into college basketball real quick. I wanted to pull up the college basketball top 25 a little bit of a, a change up and seeing everything in college basketball this year and seeing how, how great it is. First of all, my Oklahoma Sooners are here uh, about to tip off in about an hour and 15 minutes. And so I'm, I'm really excited. One of the biggest games that I can remember in a, in a regular season game, I guess non-conference, because Oklahoma is sitting there ranked number seven, uh, going against number 11, UNC. It's going to be a really fun matchup. I think this is going to be the first big test of the season. So I'm going to finally see what this Oklahoma team is really all about. Uh, so that's one thing I'm, I'm pretty excited about and seeing where they, where they are right now in the season, sitting there at, as one of four undefeated teams. Uh, so that was another exciting thing to, to kind of look at and to see where they're sitting. But number one, uh, we actually have Purdue swapped for number one. Uh, so we have Purdue up at number one and then Kansas. We've got Houston sitting there at number three, uh, who is also one of the undefeated teams. And then we've also got Arizona at number four, Yukon at number five. Uh, we've got Marquette at number six, Oklahoma at number seven, Tennessee at number seven, or uh, sorry, at number eight. And then at number nine, we've got Kentucky. Number 10, we've got Baylor. And then UNC, North Carolina sitting at number 11, Creighton at number 12, Illinois at 13, FAU at 14, Gonzaga at 15, Colorado State at 16, BYU at 17, Clemson at 18 then you've got texas at 19 and then another undefeated team james madison university at number 20 duke uh 21 virginia at 22 memphis at 23 wisconsin at 24 and another undefeated team ole miss at number 25 guys i mean seeing all, all of these top to, top 25 rankings first a shout out of course oklahoma jumping all the way up to number seven I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get, give props to them, but also James Madison. How are we feeling about James Madison, an, an all sports school right now? We've got James Madison getting it done in football. Of course, they fell to what was it Appalachian State that they fell to. Uh, so a little bit of a bummer there. But uh, the, you know, seeing what they were able to do in, in football this year, and now jumping over to basketball, handling business, and jumping into the top twenty-five. I like James Madison. Yeah, I, I like them too, Josh. And and their basketball team is. <laughs> Their basketball team is very athletic. Uh, they shoot it well. They're very, very solid on the defensive end, and uh, they're very well coached. So, uh, you know, I think they could be one of those sleeper teams that could get to the second weekend and in March Madness and, and play for a, a Sweet 16 or possibly a Lead 8 game. Yeah. I mean, Jeremy, what, what school on that list kind of jumped out to you? I know this isn't going to seem – like a big one to me but this one is actually just a little down the road for me this is creighton here i know obviously we've heard creighton talk like we've usually hear used to hearing creighton talking about basketball but i mean jumping up jumping to number 12 for creighton they're definitely a basketball team that you do not want to mess with at this day i mean we've obviously seen creighton come out of nowhere in this situation having a nine and two record in the big east i mean th this is definitely something that's really cool and it's close to home really just a little over an hour down the road for us but i mean it's cool seeing creighton compared to like Obviously, as you mentioned, Josh, UConn, Oklahoma, Tennessee, against all these really, really big-name schools that we're obviously used to seeing. I mean, 
don't get me wrong, we're we're used to hearing Creighton's name here and there, but nothing compared to like um, like Gonzaga or Kentucky or Kansas or any big big school. And, I mean, this is definitely something that I think is really cool and it's close to home and it's kind of sen- I wouldn't say it's sentimental, but it's definitely a it's definitely a really cool value to see that a, a basketball school like Creighton, just a little uh, over an hour south of us, is is having their name up in this kind of a AP poll this early in the season so far, and hopefully they can keep that that momentum rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and Blake, your Auburn Tigers sitting there at eight and two right now. They're not in the top twenty-five, but uh, I've heard some Auburn fans kind of rooting that you know they think that they should be ranked in the top twenty-five. Are you worried about it? Nah, because at the end of the day, it's going to come down to SEC play. So you know you got to handle business there. And you know I do think Auburn deserves to be ranked, but I get why we're not. We dropped a game. Uh, at Appalachian State uh, on a Sunday at noon, and it was just a weird game, and it happens. But uh, you keep winning, and, uh, you know, we only let little little LeBronny James score five points on us, and uh, just keep winning, man. Bruce Pearl will have the guys ready. I like what Auburn brought in in the transfer portal and everything, so I think we're destined to make a run this year. Bronny James didn't score at all on Oklahoma when Oklahoma played USC. Uh, he also wasn't playing Kingsley. yet, but you know he uh, he didn't score, so he didn't score anything from the bench. But no, it's 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 fun to see what USC is putting together. I think the athletic program is doing the right thing. It's just whether it's going to pay off in the in the long run. Bringing in Lincoln Riley into your football program and seeing what he's done there and kind of building it up, definitely. Uh, you know, they, of course they had a very disappointing season, but seeing what he started it off with and where he's kind of worked that from. And then now their, their basketball program and, and kind of jumping their, their basketball program uh, into uh, uh, where it's been. But, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I do think USC as a whole, uh, they, they do bring a lot of uh, excitement into the sport and seeing what they've got. But uh, I, I think that USC has a, a very good shot in both basketball and, and football kind of bringing in a lot more revenue to the school and seeing what they're able to do. I think pulling in a guy like Bronny James does help because you saw lines outside of the stadium wanting to see Bronny James play. And it's, it's something too, that you can't really expect him to jump in and just be ready to go full strength right away. Uh, and then on top of that, kind of getting his chemistry with the team, uh, not being able to play in those, those games in the first part of the season, but let's jo- go ahead and jump on to the two minute drill. Jeremy, I'll let you run this part. Cause that's what you do best. Yes, sir. Let's roll. Two minute drill. First topic of the night. We got some guy that we haven't heard his name. Well, we have heard his name, but not used to on the field. But he's been on the sideline. Obviously, this is injury. Aaron Rodgers has been removed from the IR, but is not going to play the rest of the season now. Obviously, everybody knows Aaron Rodgers' career with the New York Giants or New York Jets, excuse me, that was a lot shorter than what everyone anticipated then. Now getting cleared from IR, but obviously getting the getting notification that he's not going to play in the season. They're trying to get him healthy towards next season. Then, Blake, I'm going to kick this off with you. I know Aaron Rodgers, like I said, he's not going to play. Um, do you think that this is going to hurt the New York Jets organization for not trying to get Aaron Rodgers to play? Or do you think that they're just trying to be smart here and just try and get Aaron Rodgers a complete full 100% even though he says he is? Yeah, look, the move here is to not play Aaron Rodgers. I think this is a great idea. Why play him? You don't have anything to play for, right? And, you know, I, I'm just to the point where you gotta you got to look to next season, man. Their defense can be really good uh, as long as they have solid quarterback play and they're not on the field like they were last Sunday for 90% of the game. Uh, I think you absolutely have to look to next year. Get that Achilles right. It's great that he made the fantastic comeback. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's nothing to play for this year. So just look towards next year. Absolutely. Now, Josh, I'm going to kick this off to you, obviously. Going out a little bit wide, just ask Blake, in the same situation, do you think this is the best idea for the New York Jets organization or with the quarterback situation that they have been obviously going with Zach Wilson and their secondary quarterback, which I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, I know they don't have anything to play for, but do you, or do you even think Aaron Rodgers might come back next year since he only has a one year contract deal? Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about this too with, with the Jets and the scenario in which you allow Aaron Rodgers to play. I think they're making the right decision, but looking, we, we, I think we talked about how, Really, the the last two, the last three games, they would have had to win, win at least the last two out of the three. Three out of three means absolutely send him in. 
but uh, you know, looking at it, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't think you put Aaron Rodgers in. Like Blake said, you don't have anything to play for. Get ready for next season. Let him, let him practice and, and work his, his rust off and all that stuff. But just keep him healthy. Keep him, keep him clean. Uh, don't let him get hurt again. And just prepare for next season. I, I think you know th- this whole season has just been a dumpster fire for them. If they would have led with the last three games being wins and they come into this week where he's ready to roll and he wants to get in the game, sure, why not? But you're sitting there at 5-9 and nine right now. You're not making the playoffs. Just just sit him out and let him get ready and let him prep for the next next uh, season. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I would honestly say. You guys said it the best. But moving on to our next topic, John Morant has finally made his return back to the Harwood with the Memphis Grizzlies. I know he nailed the buzzer beater for the winning the winning shot for the Grizzlies, then coming back and dropping 34 points for a return and having a game winner. Josh, I'm going to start this off with you. Do you think John Morant has finally got his head out of the clouds and is going to settle himself up and, and ball out like he should? Or do you think this is just going to be a, uh, a quick turnaround that he's going to play for a little bit and then he might get back into some trouble? Yeah, I mean, looking at looking at John Morant, I was really shocked to see him just jump f- both feet in the water right away, just cannonball, uh, you know, and, and it's it's cold water, and he's just going in there like a boss, and so he just jumped right in, and he looked like he didn't miss a beat. Uh, I'm really excited to see the kid back on the court and seeing him play. I think it's it's exciting seeing him play because he's he's a phenomenal uh, player, and if you saw that buzzer beater, you know just how, how great of a player he is and how clutch he is and how much talent he brings to the court. So seeing him, I mean, yeah, like you said, 34 points. I think he went 50% from the field, which is really good in basketball overall. You can't really expect a whole mu- a whole bunch more than that. So seeing what he was able to do last night, it seemed like, it, I, I guess, it didn't seem like he he didn't skip a beat, but it looked like he jumped in and he still has room to improve. But you're happy with that because the the few mistakes he did make didn't cost the team or anything. I, I think he looked really good for just now jumping back in from I, I, don't, I don't even know how many days it's been since he's been back on the court. Uh, so I'm I'm excited. And t- to answer your other question too, I, I hope that he has his head out of the clouds. I hope he's got his he's level headed. Uh, and, and coming back in with the right mentality because like I said he's he's a generational talent he's so fun to watch and I think him being on the court is good for the Grizzlies it's good for the NBA and it, it's good for him I think that's where he belongs so I, I really do hope that he's got his his head straight this time absolutely then Blake I'm going to kind of ask you the same question as I did to Josh I mean do you think this is definitely the time that John Moran needs to realize that you don't get very many shots in this kind of situation. He's just lucky to be able to play basketball. And coming off of a 34-point return to the NBA, I know this is definitely uh, – I wouldn't say it's a milestone, but it's definitely a great way to come back. Now, what do you think is going to be in store for John Morant's future here in the NBA, and what do you think is going to be like for the Memphis Grizzlies going on for the rest of the year? Stay clean, Ja. Stay clean, man, and, and do it off the court now. Do it off the court. And I think the Grizzlies could – I think they could get hot and make a run because uh, obviously you get one of the most electrifying basketball players uh, in the association back. And we know he's going to hoop and we know he's going to put up big numbers. I just want to see him do it off the court, Jeremy. Uh, get right, man, and, and do it the right way and be a role model to these kids. Absolutely. Now, going to our last topic here in the two-minute drill, Steelers – DeMonte Kaz suspended for the rest of the season for the hit on Michael Pittman Jr. Now, if you were to see the hit, it was not the prettiest sight that we have seen in the NFL. Now, Blake, I'm going to kick this off with you. I know he's done this before, and he's violated a lot of the NFL's safety protocols for in this kind of a situation for hits. When do you think enough is enough in this situation for – I mean, he's done it before. Now, how many times do you think he's just going to get slaps on the wrist? And now, obviously, with the NFL suspending him for the rest of the year, if he gets this situation one more time, do you think he's going to be completely booted from the NFL? Or what do you think is going to go on? My boy Levi's over here having a fit. Uh, But, look, man, I'll be honest with you. What what was he supposed to do there? Let Michael Pittman catch the ball? I mean – you're giving – I just – I don't know, man. It's football, and, and he made a play. I know it was violent and vicious and everything, but what's he supposed to do in that position? And and 
I just feel like as a defender in today's game, man, it's just really, really difficult uh, to play DB and and, uh, to play defense, period. You know, I I just feel like, I mean, in that situation, he was going in to make a football play. And, yeah, it it was a terrible hit, and Michael Pittman suffered from it, and hopefully he's okay, but... I mean, to suspend him for the entire for the rest of the season, like that's insane to me. Um, I don't know, man. I, I just think football has gotten to where uh, it is. Before long, we're going to see flags put on them, and they're not going to be able to tackle each other. And uh, it's just it's crazy to me. I, I just don't know where the sport's headed, honestly. Absolutely. And Josh, I was just going to ask you actually that same thing. Do you think in the NFL's stance for now, for especially like what Blake just mentioned, we see these guys, they're trying to just make a play then. Unfortunately, that kind of hit, it, it it's going to happen. I mean, we obviously don't like seeing players getting injured, of course. But, I mean, do you think the NFL is getting a little bit soft in these situations? Or do you think that they're pulling the right kind of moves to suspend him for the rest of the year? Or do you think that this was a kind of a little bit overboard? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm right there. I mean, pretty well on, on with Blake. I mean, looking at the situation, seeing the hit, it was a vicious hit. I, I think it should have been called targeting. I think it was a target. When, by the definition, uh, it, it was, you know. And I think seeing what, what targeting has become, I think there's a lot of targeting calls that get called that shouldn't be and there's a lot of them that you just kind of question uh and and i do think that's gone too soft but that one was was a very aggressive hit uh if you want to suspend them for the game sure i think targeting needs to be reevaluated i think suspending somebody for an entire game over targeting is is too much now you're suspending them for the season because of this hit and and you know I, i i'm right there with blake i think it was a very it was a very aggressive hit but sometimes you are just going in aggressively because you're trying to make the right play. And you're, you're, I don't know what else he was supposed to do in that situation if he wants to defend the ball. I don't think he intended to actually hurt him. It didn't look intentional at all. It looked like he was just trying to make a big big hit to jar the ball loose. That's what his job is. So suspending him for the whole season, that definitely takes it too far in, in my eyes. I don't, I don't think the whole season was really the right punishment. I, I don't think the punishment fits the crime whatsoever. I agree with that. I mean, when I first got the notification to say that he was suspended for the year, I was I was utterly shocked just because, like, in this sense, we've obviously just used to seeing maybe, like, a fine in this situation but not getting suspended for the whole year. But um, I'm not going to go on farther just because I, if I do, we're going to be here for another hour. But that's all we got on the two-minute drill. Josh, what do we have left on our lineup tonight? All that we have left is our DraftKings bets. Of course, our DraftKings Ooh. bets are presented by DraftKings. You guys can check out DraftKings. If you're into sports betting, you know that it's very important to have a very good, very reliable sports book that you can go to that you know you're going to put your money in and be able to get more money out of it because you know that it's going to be reliable. It's not going to steal your money unless you're just a really bad sports better. So we do recommend and, and strongly urge you that if you were going to be on any kind of sports book and being on any kind of sports betting that you please bet responsibly uh, and you must be 21 or older to take any kind of sports betting uh, or to participate in any kind of sports betting you can go to rising2.com slash draftkings that's r-i-s-i-n-g-t-o dot com slash draftkings and you can sign up today bet five dollars and get 150 dollars in bonus bets instantly that promotion may vary by location so you'll have to check into it for your location and you must be in a, in a state where it is legal for you to bet with DraftKings. but go check it out DraftKings, one of our favorites to use uh i'll go ahead and start us off with tonight we're going to be betting for thursday uh, games since we're recording this on a wednesday but it's going to be thursday when it's released so we're going to put out our our bets for tomorrow which will be today for you guys it gets very confusing on this side of the camera um, just so you guys know how much effort we put into this and we have to sit here and try to guess ahead of time when a lot of the a lot of the odds might even change by tomorrow too so whenever we're whenever we're making the big bucks where we can be paid and be able to do this the day of that'll make it a lot easier on us Um, but i'll start us off my DraftKings bets i'm going to go with arizona money line over the sharks the coyotes over the sharks in the nhl uh, I'm going to take the money line there at minus 155. I'm liking this. I think the coyote, the I don't know if you want to say coyotes or coyotes, um, but Arizona, I think they're doing some things that 
make it look like this franchise is starting to turn around into something a little better than what it's been for really the last 20, 25 years. So I like what's what they're going over there. Plus the Sharks are just an atrocious, uh, you know, team right now. They do not look good. And then I'm also going to take the Saint the Saints Rams Thursday night football under. Uh, it's hard for me to take an under because I love rooting for the offense, but I'm going to take the under at 46 and a half, uh, and that is minus 110. And then Matthew Stafford, I'm going to also go into the uh, Thursday night football, and I'm going to take a prop bet, which I don't think we hardly ever do on this show, but I'm going to take a prop bet. I'm going to take Matthew Stafford over 246 and a half passing yards at minus 115 because I think he's going to light them up, uh, and I think the Saints' defense is not very good but I don't think he's going to score a lot. I think he's going to be able to pass at free will. Uh, Jeremy, let's kick it over to you. What's your DraftKings bets for tonight? My DraftKings bets for the night, I am going with the money line for the LA Kings versus the Seattle Kraken, and I am going with the LA Kings for the win at minus 170. I mean, looking at the LA Kings, they've definitely been firing on all cylinders, and don't get me wrong, the Seattle Kraken have been there, but they just haven't looked right to be completely honest with you in my opinion and my second one for the night i have the vegas golden knights versus the Tampa bay lightning and i am sticking with vegas because what happens in vegas stays in vegas baby and i'm having them pull out the dub at minus 102 then the golden knights they've just been what do you have to say about the golden knights if you if you if you pull off the win against them you you feel like you just probably won the stanley cup i'm I'm surprised that one's only Um, at a minus 102 i I would think that they'd be i know much more than that I know. When They're I saw that, that's why I jumped on him. Like, there's no way this is at minus 102. I thought I, I thought I was reading it wrong. But then my last one for the night, I'm going with the over-under situation. I'm going with the De- New Jersey Devils versus the Edmonton Oilers. And this one, I was in the same situation, but it was up there. And I was really tempted to even pick the over just because you got these two teams that are firing on all cylinders and just playing good hockey. I am going with the under on this one and it is at minus 112 and the over under situations at seven goals and i mean at this i mean you look at you look at the both of these teams i mean the, the edmondson oilers just give the puck to Connor mcdavid he could probably put it in the net five five times out of ten the uh, same with the, the new jersey devils with the hughes brothers and miko heizer and yes for Bra and it's just been it's just been an all around good year for the New Jersey Devils and the Edmonton Oilers. So that's my three bets. Blake, we're gonna leave it off with you. What do you got for tonight? Uh, give me Syracuse and college football money line. I like the orange. Uh, give me the Maple Leafs money line, uh, and then I will take the Rams money line as well. So those will be my three. All right. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the Rams too. I mean, looking at them. I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the Thursday night football games, the way that they've been, too. They've been all just duds, but then we have a couple of them that just go off and they hit hard. Uh, I think we had that Cowboys, uh, who was that? The Cowboys-Seahawks game. That one turned into a really fun game. And then last week, we had the Raiders getting just, you oh know, just gosh. going out there and just, ooh, that was a, an atrocious game, getting Brandon Staley fired. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's been it's been a weird year, just in the NFL as a whole. Um, and I, I guess one thing before we go too, guys, I wanted to ask you because we didn't really touch anything on the NFL too much. Um, do you guys think the Eagles are in trouble right now with three straight losses? Jalen Hurts, of course, he was sick in this last game, so maybe you don't put a whole lot on it. Um, but do you think do you think they're looking like a little bit of a, a fraudulent team? Defense is cheeks. <laughs> Defense is buns. All right, that secondary is buns. They're in trouble, brother. They're in trouble. I, I mean, I I think I'm I'm not too, I'm not so much worried personally about the three losses. It's the way that those three losses came from the 49ers and the Cowboys, especially the Seahawks. I can write off and say your team wasn't at full health, and and the main guy just did he didn't look right in just all of his decisions. Um, but getting blown out by two divisional or not division, but conference leaders. And then a Cowboys being your divisional leader right now, sort of. Um, but I it just, the way that you lost in a couple of those games kind of hurts, but Jeremy, what do you think with the Eagles right now? I mean, I understand, like you said, the best, the Phil, this last game, they weren't all hundred percent healthy, but as your cousin Britain would say, we'll be due. 
I mean, in this perspective, I I think they're honestly starting to starting to choke a little bit in this situation. I don't know if the if the if the spotlight's getting to them and they're just sweating and they can't pull the strings back together. But if they pull off one more loss, they're definitely they're they're going to be they're definitely going to be in a world of hurt. And don't get me wrong, they already are, but this is definitely not what we expected. Yeah, but anyways, back to our bets. Uh, right now we are sitting where Jeremy and I, really the whole squad, man, guys, we did not start off well in our first night on the bets. So we're going to have to get back on track. Hopefully these all hit and we go 3-0 because Jeremy and I are sitting at 0-3. Blake is at, in the lead of the pack with going 1-2. Uh, Woo! So, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're up ahead, but none of us have too much to be happy with right now. I think we're all negative right now in the – and the overall, well, obviously we're all negative right now on the overall units, so we're going to have to hit some jackpots and get something going. But everybody who's listening and watching, go check out DraftKings. If you haven't already downloaded DraftKings and you're in a state where you're allowed to bet on DraftKings, go check them out. You can sign up at rising2.com slash DraftKings. That lets them know that we sent you. And you can sign up today, bet $5, get $150 in bonus bets if you use that link. And again, that's promotion may vary based on your location. Please be 21 or older. Uh, you must be 21 or older to bet uh, and use DraftKings and please <coughs> bet responsibly. But guys, that's pretty much all that we have for tonight. I guess today, uh, we thank you all so much for watching, for listening. Make sure to hit that like button. Follow us on social media. You can follow us on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of that fun stuff. And then if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, you can leave us a five-star review. That is the greatest way to help us over there. Our numbers have been soaring through the roof on pretty much every platform, uh, especially on audio right now. Uh, so we thank all of you guys for helping us get to newer heights uh, and, and much higher heights than the heights would be of the the height scale. Uh, I don't know how, how else you want to put that. But guys, we thank you all so much for all of your love and support. And until next time.